ready for the word? Yeah. All right, if you guys could put your hands together and welcome Pastor Doug Garasic all the way from up in Youngstown, Ohio, as he comes to deliver the word. Man, do you love your pastors, Pastor uh, Chris and Melissa, or what? Can you give it up for them? Can I say this? Listen, 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 listen. Y'all didn't clap good. I'm going to say it again, then you're going to clap really good, okay? Here's the thing that we do when God is doing what he's doing here is, if, if we're not careful, and I know this has never reached church, it's only my church that does this, but we can, if we're not careful, we can treat the extraordinary move of God as ordinary. And we can start saying, well, this is just how church always is, and this is just what it's like, and this is, we've come familiar with it. And I don't know if you realize, so I'm here just to give you a reminder that what God has done in them in five short years is less than a miracle. It's supernatural. And so when I say give it up for your pastors, because where there was not, God made a way through them. So can you give it up for your pastors, Pastor Chris and Melissa? Maybe by the end of the message, we'll be there, and they'll be throwing money at the stage, and no, I'm kidding. Hey, listen, I'm a crowd participation preacher. I really get excited when you get excited. I preach better when you give it back to me. So you can do anything. You can say amen. You can say, yeah, it's good. You can say, preach it, white boy, whatever you like. So I'm going to count to three, and whatever you want to shout out, let's just try it right now. One, two, three. Amen. It's good. We're getting there. We're getting there. Do me a favor. Stand to your feet really quickly. I just need to do this with you. I was reading a study about the human brain. I saw this. I want to kind of just see if it works for us. Do me a favor because I'm short. I'm going to get up taller. Do me a favor. When, when, right now, I want you to open up your hands. Okay, open up your hands real big. And I want you to clap, but don't release it. Just clap it and hold it. Okay, you ready? Hold on, hold on. Some of you are listening. Just wait. One, two, three. Now stop. Leave it right where it is. Leave it right where it is. If, leave it, come on, clap it together, hold it together. If your left thumb is over your right hand, lift it up. You are some of the most intelligent people in the room. That's what this study says. If your right thumb is over your left hand, lift it up. You're some of the best looking people in the world. Now listen, does anyone have both their hands together when you lift them up in the air? You just think that you're very good looking and we love you anyways. I'm kidding. Give somebody a big high five and say, God bless tonight. Let's get this thing going. Mike's a little hot right here. Can we turn it down? Has anyone ever heard the name Marvis Frazier before? Anybody know who that is? Marvish Fraser. You know who that is? He was a boxer back in the day. He was a pretty good boxer. He fought a lot, and he got to the point where he was in the number one contender to fight the Mike Tyson for the heavyweight fight and for the title and all that good stuff. And so, you know, in boxing, they have pre-interviews, and they line up, and Don King's there with his crazy hair, and Marvis Frazier's here, Mike Tyson's over here, and they're asking questions to the fighters, asking them, hey, what are you going to do? How are you going to do this? And at this time, Mike Tyson has been beating up everybody. He hasn't bitten any ears off yet. He is a mean, rough dude. And in this interview, Marvin Frazier decides to go on a tirade about Mike Tyson. And here's what he says. Because up until this moment, Tyson has never been beat. And he says, listen, I've studied Mike Tyson's game. I know what he does. I can see how he works. He's slow here. He doesn't do this right. I'm conditioned for him. I'm ready for this fight. I've never been more ready. And you're going to watch Mike Tyson get beat for the very first time on this day on pay-per-view. And so the reporter who asked him a question looks at Mike Tyson. He says, what do you have to say to what Marvin Harris Frazier has said about you? Mike leans into the microphone and just says this. Everybody's got a game plan. You like my Mike Tyson? Everybody's got a game plan till they get punched in the face. And that's all he said. They opened this up. If you know anything about boxing, Marvis Frazier lasted 30 seconds against Mike Tyson. He got knocked out. And what's interesting about this moment is when I remember watching that, I thought to myself, isn't it interesting as Christians and as people that follow God and people that are hungry for the things of God, is we get these game plans, we get this inspiration, we get these moments where we feel like God is moving in our lives and we get excited about it, but then the devil comes in and he wants to punch us in the face. And here's my question to you. How will you respond when you get punched in the face? 
How will you respond when somebody comes up and sucker punches you from behind? When life doesn't work the way you want it to? When things aren't going the way you like it to be? And all of a sudden, the life has this way of blasting us in the face. And I want to know that if you and I are going to take that hit, how are we going to respond? Because here's the thing about taking hits. It's not if you're going to take a hit. It's when you're going to take a hit. It's not if you're going to get attacked as a Christian. It's not if you're going to go through trials. It's when you go through trials. When you go through hardships. When things aren't working the way you want them to work. How are you going to respond? And the sad reality to many people that I see is when the going gets tough, they start get going. And I believe that God wants to raise up a people that are unashamed of being unashamed. I believe God wants to raise up a people who are saying, I don't care how bad it gets. I don't care how hard it is. I don't care what the devil throws at me because I've got Jesus in my corner. There is no way he's going to win. Because here's what I believe. That the good things of my faith journey don't begin until I endure some hardship. See, a lot of us, if we're not careful, we can view God like a genie in a bottle. We can just hope that if we rub him the right way, like Christina Aguilera told us. Sorry, bad early 2000s joke. <laughs> that if God would be like that genie and he would give us his wishes, then he loves us. But what happens when pain and hardship and some endurance come in our lives? Immature Christians run from that pain to go to something else. When we want to develop ourselves as honest Christ followers who are after him, then we've got to be willing to stick in the fight. Because sometimes it's not always easy, but when I read my Bible, I never saw anywhere where it was promised to be easy. I just know he promised to be there with me through every step of the way. And so I'm in the scriptures and I'm reading in King, 1 Kings chapter 18. And I see this story that reminds me of what I saw with Mike Tyson talking about, hey, everybody's got a game plan. So they get hit in the face. And I want you to read along with me in 1 Kings chapter 18. In this moment, there has not been rain for a long time, actually over three years. Elijah just beat up all these people and the people of God are celebrating that Elijah has won against all these prophets of Baal and, and the king ah Ahab is all excited about this moment and, and we pick up in the story where Elijah is predicting that God is about to do something crazy because it hasn't rained. And here's what it says in verse 41. Elijah said to King Ahab, go and enjoy a good meal for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. For I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. Let me tell you something about the characteristic of God. You will never see God before you hear God. God is not in the business of showing up first, then speaking to you second. God is in the business of you listening and hearing and responding in faith, even though you cannot see it just yet. I remember being 18 years old, wilding out, partying, living it up, and this man, your pastor, got a hold of my life. And he said, listen, you've got a destiny and a purpose inside of you. Would you quit acting like a knucklehead? I said, that's all I know how to act like. He says, no, 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 no. I, I believe God is doing something. And I had to trust the voice of God speaking through him. That, that, that I had to hear it to believe it. Even though my life didn't have evidence of it, a man of God saw it. And here's what I want you to understand about a man of God like Elijah and the pastor that you have. Is they will hear from God before they ever see God do anything. So if you ever think, Pastor Chris is crazy, launching campuses, building buildings, doing these things, can't we just be happy with where we are? Never for a man of God. Because I'm always hearing God saying something before I ever see it happen in my life. And if I stop hearing from God, then I should not be a pastor of the church that I pastor. And we see in verse 41 here that Elijah is hearing that there is a storm a coming. Now listen, it's been storming here for a couple good days, hasn't it? Like y'all ain't prepared for a storm in Austin, Texas. There ain't no drainage. There is puddles everywhere. But what I love about this prophet Elijah is he was ready for a storm and he heard it coming. God will always speak before he reveals himself. Verse 42 says it like this. So Ahab the king prepared a feast. But Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel. And he fell to the ground and he prayed. Let's stop right there. 
I think for some of us, we so desperately want God to do something. We're so hungry for God to move, but are we willing to climb to mountaintops? Are we willing to exert ourselves for God to move? Are we willing to give up of what we have? Before God will ever reveal something to you, he wants to use you in the process. So if you're saying, God, use me, God, use me, God, do something in my life, then here's my encouragement to you. If you see a need, fill the need. And I see Elijah here exerting his energy, climbing up to a mountain. He could have said to God, hey, speak to me right here. It's good, right? Why do I got to climb up a mountaintop for you? Because God wants to see if we're going to put action to our faith. And Elijah, before he even saw what God was going to do, began to climb up this mountain. And here's the next thing. When he got to the mountaintop, he did not say, look how great I am. I built, I got to this mountain. I did these things. The Bible says that he fell to his knees and he prayed. And I want to encourage you, yes, we need to exert ourselves to follow God, but we also need to humble ourselves to hear from God. He humbled himself. When was the last time? I'm not talking, listen, I pray in the car because if I don't pray in the car, I'm going to kill somebody with road rage. Amen? So I'm praying in the spirit in the car all the time. Because if I don't, it's going to be either a cuss word or a praise word. I'm going to give a praise word to Jesus instead. But here's the truth. That is a certain way of praying. But when was the last time that you physically said to yourself, I'm going to humble myself before God and I'm going to kneel down before him because he paid it all for me and I'm going to bow my life to God. Because I think we want to shout out to God in emergencies when things aren't going the way we want them to. But we don't take time in our lives to say, you are my Lord, not just my God. See, a God can save you, but a Lord is who you live for. See, see I, I got a God who saved me when I reached out and said, save me. But now I chose to make him the Lord of my life, which means I bow before my Lord to get instruction from him. And I want to encourage you wherever you are and whatever you're going through, don't neglect the power of kneeling before God and praying. And we see this in Elijah as he knelt down before God and he humbled himself. He wasn't afraid to do that. Verse 43 then said his servant, then he said to his servant, go and look outside towards the sea. The servant went and looked, but when he returned, he said, I didn't see anything. So Elijah knows rain's coming. He's been praying on the mountain. He humbled himself. He exerted himself. And then he tells one of his servants, one of those ones following his vision, hey, go out to the sea. Go out to where I know rain's going to come from and tell me if you see rain. And I don't know about you, but if I'm the prophet of God who's heard from God, I'm excited to have confirmation that God is going to do something. But here's the interesting thing. His servant comes back. You know, man, when I used to work for Pastor Chris and I had to tell him bad news, I didn't want to tell him it. So like something went wrong, like in the parking lot, like a teenager burned a car by accident or something. Cause that never happened where we were, but it might've happened. And they'd be like, Hey, someone's got to go tell pastor Chris. They'd all point at me. And I said, mm -mm, ruh -ruh, not me. <laughs> Somebody else tell him. Cause if you've ever been that servant, you don't want to go tell the prophet. Hey, you said there was going to be rain. And one precursor for rain is clouds. And there ain't no clouds in the air prophet, but I believe you. <laughs> I'd be scared. And listen, I've been beat by him butt naked. He'd beat me again if he needed to in that moment. <laughs> so this servant walks up to Elijah, and I can imagine the fear inside of that servant. Hey, uh, uh, Pastor, Pastor Elijah, uh, th there's no clouds. So let's keep reading because this is when it gets really, really interesting. Seven times, say seven times. Seven times. Elijah told him to go back and look. And seven times he went, and there wasn't any rain. Imagine the anxiety. We talked about getting punched in the face. Elijah hears from God. It's going to rain. It hasn't rained in three years. We've got a drought. We need rain. God, we've done everything you've asked us to do. We need you to show up. We've done our part. Are you going to do your part? And seven times this young man runs out to the coast, looks, and realizes there's no rain, and have to slowly get his way back to his prophet and say, there's no rain. I don't know what to do. Go back five times three times, six times, and he keeps going back. Because here's the thing about men of faith, is even if it's not in front of us, we know God's still gonna do it. 
With Elijah in this moment, he knows God spoke it. I don't know when he's going to do it. I don't know how many times I have to go back to the well to see it. But sooner or later, because my God is a God who follows through with his promises. My God is a God who does not back down from his word. He is not a liar. He is not a man. He will not change his mind. And I know my God. Go back there and you tell me when that cloud comes. Some of us, the first time something doesn't go right, we go, oh, that must not be God. Huh, well, I mean, God, you know, I wanted to serve. I wanted to get involved. It didn't work out. Nobody called me back. Oh, I, I wanted to start that business, but every time I did it, it fell apart. Listen, if God spoke to you, you're not obligated to fulfill it. You're obligated to be obedient. Wow. Preach it, white boy. <laughs> when God speaks a word, it is not our job to manifest it. It's our job to be obedient to it. And if God has spoken to you to go off and do something audacious that scares you beyond belief, then I want to encourage you, step out in faith and quit letting fear paralyze you. Let your faith have movement and say, God, I don't know how you're going to do it. It doesn't make sense to me, but I am trusting that you are the God who follows through with your word. And so Elijah seven times says, go back, go back. I will not accept the report that the enemy says that there is no rain coming. And this is when it gets real good. And then the seventh time, the servant came running back to him. And here's what he says. I saw a little cloud about the size of a hand rising from the sea. A itty bitty. They had to put in the Bible a little cloud. Couldn't just be a normal cloud. The servant was still kind of dogging him in the process. Okay, Elijah, there's a little cloud coming. Elijah sees that God is about to show up. And here's what happens in the very next verse. Elijah shouted to his king, King Ahab, hurry up, Ahab. And and he told him, go climb on your chariot and go back home. If you don't hurry, the rain will stop you. Y'all know something in Austin about rain stopping you, don't you? Y'all know something about that. Let me tell you something about God. When he shows up, Elijah freaks. This is happening. The clouds are showing up. He gets Ahab, who he told to have a feast, to to celebrate what victory they just had. He said, Ahab, Ahab, wrap it up. Wrap it up. You got to go and get on your chariot right now. Because if you don't, you're going to get stuck in the storm. And you're not going to want to be in the storm. Let me tell you something about God. And if you got an amen in your spirit, let it out. My God makes kings run. My God makes kings run for their lives. There is no king on this world that will not bow his knee to Almighty God. There is no president or candidate who will not bow their knee to Almighty God. Because my God makes kings run on their chariots. And I see Elijah in this moment telling his king, you better run because if you get caught in this, you're not going to like the outcome because when my God shows up, he doesn't show up with a little bit, even though all you see is a little cloud because when he shows up, it's going to be a full out flood because God will always give more than enough in that moment. See, I know a little bit about that in my life. When we started our first campus with your support and we were able to launch our church, we saw God moving in incredible ways. I put our campus at the local mall where I actually worked at Champ Sports in high school. And I remember being so proud of the fact that we were back in our hometown and we were doing this. But I grew up on the wrong side of the tracks. I grew up in a place called Warren, Ohio, which has a medium income of about $19,000. My mother had me at 16 years old. It was, it was a teenage pregnancy in the 80s, not something that you're very proud of. We grew up in a very hard atmosphere. I thought it was normal for my matchbox cars to naturally go down the floor when I let them go. I didn't realize that the apartment we lived in was slanted. And so I always had a heart to go back to the city that, that, that I grew up in, which is right next to where our first campus was. And I knew God put in my heart to put a church there. And we were praying, and we're praying, and we're fasting, and we're, we're asking God to show us. And in the news, there was a, on New Year's Eve, there was a murder in a bar downtown. And this murder happened in the bar. The guy got shot on the dance floor. He tried to run out of the bar. And as he was running out of the bar, he collapsed in the doorway and died half on the street, half in the bar. Well, the bar had so many problems, so many issues. It was right in the downtown that they put racketeering charges on the bar owners because they had the police call 26 times in six months on them. All these drug issues, all these things, and basically the 
federal, the FBI, close this bar down or threaten to if they didn't just vacate and leave it. So I'm noticing as we're praying for a campus, praying for God to put a, right in the city I grew up in, a church, this bar that has all this bad press, all this negative news, a place known for death was for sale. And I thought I heard God say, I want you to go to that bar. So I roll up and I call the owner. And the owner is every other word a cuss word, every other word frustrated, thinks it's a conspiracy against him to run him out of town. And he puts his bar at three times the price I can afford to buy it. There's no way. I don't have this kind of money. And I want to buy this bar because I believe God wants to put a church in this bar. And it's not happening, though, because the owner's like, dude, I'm not a Christian. Are you going to buy my liquor license? I'm like, well, we do take communion. Maybe we can work something out. I don't know. I don't know. He's just going nowhere with us. He wants to sell it for way more money than we can afford to buy it for. There's a guy going to my church who was just saved. You know what I mean by just saved? Like they just, they, they love Jesus, but that's about it right there. And they will still cut you and leave you bleeding in the side alley. But they'll pray for you at the end of it. And his name was Big Rick. Can you say Big Rick? Big Rick. He's a big dude. He's about six foot seven, big guy. He was known as a local mobster, kind of a collector for somebody. I don't want to get into detail about it, but he was a scary dude. And he comes up to me, and I'm like, all of, like, I'm like three foot eight. And I'm like, hi, Big Rick. And he's like, you know, seven foot. And he's like, hey, Pastor, uh, I heard that you were checking out that bar. Are you going to try to buy that bar? I'll make it a church, huh, Pastor? I said, well, I want to, Big Rick, but, I mean, this guy's just, he's just not listening, you know. He wants so much money. I don't even know if he's going to get that for market value. I think I'm being more than reasonable. I looked up the property value. I tried to make him an offer close to the property value, but he wants, like, three times that for this busted-up bar that I'm going to put a bunch of money into anyways to fix it up. Hey, when's the next time you're going to meet with him, Pastor? You're going to meet with him real soon? Yeah, we're going to meet tomorrow at, like, 3 o'clock. I'll be there. Are you asking? Are you telling me? Okay, sure, you'll be there. <laughs> you just let Big Rick do what Big Rick's going to do. I walk in. Big Rick's not there yet. I'm talking to the bar owner. He's being very combative to me. He's getting frustrated. He's like, Pastor, I don't care about a church. I'm not a Christian. You got to eat. Just, just being belittling, and he's just being like, he's just shutting me down left and right. I'm like, man, God, do something. And Big Rick opens the door. Big Rick is a known mobster. And this bar owner who knows who Big Rick is, face turns white. He goes, Rick, Rick, what are you, what are you, what are you doing here? He goes, this is my pastor. <laughs> he goes, you go to church? Oh, I've been going to church. <laughs> and he says, my pastor's offering you a fair deal. I think it would be wise if you took that deal. <laughs> I'm looking at Big Rick. I'm like, this is about to go down. <laughs> bulletproof vest hide in the closet <laughs> and this guy true story says what was your offer again to me I said the number he says I'll take your offer <laughs> we bought it in cash the next day <laughs> now you might say that don't sound very Christian like sure. but let me tell you something when an authority greater than the one you're facing shows up the one you're facing runs and this man was holding back what God wanted to do. And God says, I will use anyone and anything, even a mobster like Big Rick, to show up on the scene and make a way where there was no way. So you might say, Doug, I don't know how this authority and adversary that I'm fighting is going to go away. I don't know how it's going to be fixed in my marriage and my finances and my broken home. All these things. I want to tell you, when you lean on the problem solver, not on the problem, things begin to change. Come on. I'm just getting started. Because I, I, I'm guilty of this, and maybe you are too, that I focus on the problem when I've got the problem solver behind me saying, just let me get in the way of this. You can't do this on your own, but I can do things that you can never do. Just like Big Rick showing up at the bar, he did things that I could never do. But God had a plan. And my God makes kings run. Would you stand to your feet with me? I just feel like God wants to do something and break some things open in our lives tonight. And my prayer is, as I've just talked to you for a few minutes, that you begin to open up your spirit and say, God, if you want to do something in me, I want it so very badly. 
And so here's where I'm at. I want to make some decrees. And if somebody wants to come out and play, that would be great. But I want to make some decrees in this place. And if you're here saying, I am far from where I need to be, I know that God has been speaking to me. I've heard him wanting to use me. But because I haven't seen it, I have doubted God moving in my life. And here's what I want to say. God will always speak before you ever see. Are you willing to exert yourself with where you are? And are you willing to humble yourself before him? And as we do these things, here's what I know. The authorities and the principalities in our life that try to prevent us from the move of God begin run when God shows up even in a little bit. Because when God shows up in a little bit, that means he's going to come in a whole bunch. So here's where I'm at. You might be here saying, I need God to move in my life. And I want to be sensitive to that moment. And I want to speak some decrees over your life. But here's what I want to do. Can you guys throw up on this screen the, the, the cloud, the empty cloud picture that I, I, I have? Just a big sky. There it is. You all notice here that there's one cloud in this picture? It's about the size of a hand. It's not a big cloud. You wouldn't think rain was coming by that. But if you're here and you're saying, I'm ready for a breakthrough as I speak some of these things out, would you do me a favor? Would you do God the service and say, I'm going to lift this hand-sized cloud up to heaven. And as I lift this hand-sized cloud up to heaven, I'm believing that this thing that I'm waiting to see God move in, he's going to begin to move right now. Can we do that? Can you pray? Can you play? Great. Here we go. If you're here and your marriage is broken and you don't know where to go and you're saying, God, I want it to be what it was when we first got together. I want it to be the marriage that I always knew it was supposed to be. I want to be in ministry with my spouse. I want to see us moving together. I want to be raising our children together. I want to see us live like never before. Just begin to reach your hand up to heaven. I decree and I declare that your marriage's best days are ahead of you. That the moments where you feel it's a mess, God is making a message out of it. And you're going to bring healing and restoration to people that don't think they can make it. You're going to be the leaders of them knowing that their marriage is going to uh, going to change because you are willing to make your marriage change. If you're here and your kids are far from God and you so desperately want them to come home, you so desperately want them to be in the house of God, worshiping and surrendering their lives, then lift your hand high. And I declare that your children will see your faith and out of your faith, they'll have a hunger for God, that you will lead the way that those places of brokenness and those fallouts, that you would humble yourself and say, I'm going to reach out, I'm going to pray, I'm going to kneel, I'm going to humble myself because my children are my legacy. And because they're my legacy, I want to give them to God. If you're here right now and you're suffering from past mistakes, you can't seem to let go of the past, I declare that your past will not be your future that what God is doing in you will be a message to all those who are willing to go after him. That your testimony would change lives and it is time to quit living in the past and let go of the baggage and follow God today. God is not beating you up and let me tell you, he's not mad at you, but he is mad about you. And so let it go and let God. If you're here and you need physical healing in your body, You're wanting God to move, and you don't know how it's going to happen. The doctor's telling you nothing like that is going to be there. Would you raise your hand like that cloud and say, God, with the faith of this cloud, I know by your stripes I can be healed. And like the woman with an issue of blood, I will fight through the crowds, and I will reach up to grab the hem of your garment because I know that you and you alone are the author and the finisher, and you are the great physician. So heal me now. If you're here and you've let go of your calling, you heard God speak to you a long time ago. Let me say this. Don't let pride get in your way. Would you reach your hand up right now? And God, I just decree that every calling, every purpose you've made would be resurrected. Just like the song we sang, the resurrecting king would begin to resurrect those callings. And he'd bring them back to life because you are not against us and you are not holding a grudge against our mistakes. But now I speak that those callings would come back to life. That those purposes, we need you in this church to accept that calling. Because there are people that are waiting to be broken into the kingdom based upon what you have to give. So quit living in your mistakes. Quit living in your failures. Quit living in whatever you say is why you aren't following God's call in your life. And let's start doing it today. 
And I bless you now as Reach Church to go to new levels. We know with every new level, there's new devils, but we are ready for God to move. So move in us first. Shift what you need to shift. And let us be people who are audacious about following a God who chases after kings and makes them run. In Jesus' name, let that faith arise. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you guys. We love you. In Youngstown, thank you.